So my my intro is also getting more elaborate every time. Every time I do a <laughs> podcast, eventually it's going to get to like WWE style. And that's the dream. <laughs> <laughs> um, Are you ready to podcast? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Introducing John Cena. <laughs> Um, cool. So hey everyone and welcome back to the LAN Party podcast. Today I'm very excited to say that we've got the ultimate esports organism, Chris Smith. Chris, <laughs> tell us about yourself. I forgot I told you that, yeah. the ultimate esports organism. I have, to, I have to dig up that photo. It was a meme that someone made of me oh, was it? many, many years ago. It was like 2013, I think it is. And there's a picture of me. Oh, there was a, a classic thing in Thermal Take um, when I worked there of, of a lot of the Taiwanese workers lining up together after a trade show or after a, you know, a consumer show and doing all thumbs up in a line together. And they've all got their arm extended with a thumbs up. So I did that with my guys as a bit of a joke in Melbourne when I did PAX Australia and someone cut me out and then cut my torso off and put me on, um, put me on some jello and then... <laughs> The caption was the ultimate esports organism, <laughs> and I have I have no idea what it even means. I just thought no, it was funny. So it doesn't really mean yeah. anything, but it's amazing, and I love it. Yeah. yeah. And the yeah. day that you asked me, like, what what should you call me? It came off my Facebook memories, so I was oh, like, why it? not? That is perfect. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's that's your intro now. That is exactly what you're going to be known for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's pretty much that's pretty much who I am through and through. But for me, like, you know, around my history in esports, um, I often say I've kind of sat on all six sides of the fence, really. So, mm. I did a bit of everything, and that's not it's not even necessarily bragging. It's the fact that I couldn't find where my fit was in the industry, and it explains right. as to where I am today. So I, I started off as a top level player in a few different games. So I played in some of the best teams in Australia for Battlefield Two, um, for Battlefield Bad Company Two. Um, then I went to Counter-Strike Source, a very hard transition, nothing mm. notable in there whatsoever. Mm. And then on to Counter-Strike Global Offensive when that launched. And we were in a top top four, top six team in Australia. We'd play sixth at tournament, probably realistically fourth, I, I think. That is awesome. Um, I also, you know, did a bit of everything else. I became a commentator during my Battlefield 2 days because that was quite interesting mm. to me. That allowed me to gain a lot of experience in the industry and get in the same way that I tell pretty much everything one to is just pick one thing and stick with it. So for me, I started doing commentary and then I started asking for more and more jobs within that volunteer organization. You know, okay. I was commentating Battlefield 2 only, but then I was saying, hey, you guys aren't in Counter-Strike Source. I've just started playing. Can I do that? And I said, yep, go for it. And then I said, well, I want to do a weekly flash game review because you guys don't do any reviews. Can I do that? I said, okay. yep, all right. And then I started com commentating some COD 4 and then their marketing guy left. So I started doing that. Then I started working with LAN parties to help us advertise them and them advertise us and us pass some stuff on. You know, you can see where this is going, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I just started to take yeah. more responsibilities. That enabled me to meet a guy called Jonathan Tiong, who's responsible for getting me into the industry. And he came to me and said, Chris, I'm a graphics designer, ad distributor for a company. And this company wants to launch a new um, business line within them uh, by running a $30,000 tournament. And I'm the only person they know that plays games and has run a LAN party before. So they've told me I have to do it. Please help. I have no idea. So I said, all right, no worries. I'll, I'll help you out. So it was a bit of a trial by fire for both of us, but yeah. you know, we ran what I believe was at that time, the largest prize pool tournament in, in Counter-Strike Source in Australian history. So it was about in AUD, 15K of cash, 15K of prizes. Um, and you know, good. it was an online yeah. qualifiers or live finals. We had seven teams at live finals and we also tried to pioneer um, supporting teams to get to that event as well. So if you were the top six teams, you got a thousand dollars each to help with your flights and accommodation. And That's then really teams good. seven and eight got 500. So ran that, um, the company I did that for thermal take, liked what I did, offered me a job, moved out to Melbourne, worked for them for four years as a community and esports manager, um, which is, you know, a great part of my growth. Cause really I had no idea what I was doing and they'll pay mm. me to figure it out. <laughs> um, so I did that for four years, trade shows. I managed one of Australia's first professional gamers over that period of time. A guy called Jared Pig Krenzel was his sponsor and his manager, as was very common in those days. Okay. Um, I was a semi pro CSGO player during that time as well. Then started, um, running my own Counter-Strike tournaments. I'd either run them and play in them or run them and commentate them. Mm -hmm. Both things I would not suggest. Um, <laughs> a lot of hard work. And, yeah. and you don't run a quality product if you do that. No, um, and yeah, ended up leaving that. Went to, kind of, kind of went to leave the industry, but kind of half left. I um, mm. went to study social work for a year. 
Um, but over that time, I was a journalist as well for about a year and a half, okay. um, just doing news and reviews, smartwatches, smartphone reviews, audio, and, and just general consumer news. Yeah. Motherboards get released, et cetera. Um, and then I got headhunted back in the industry by Corsair. They said, hey, we want our, to have a first employee in Australia. We'd like you to apply. We think you're what it takes. And so I said no. Then I said yes. <laughs> then I applied and, and got the job. So I worked for them for two years, ended up leaving to run my own thing. So like, as you can see here, you know, if you were, if you were at an Intel Extreme Masters esports event, I've been there as a tournament operator, yeah. as the stage host and commentator, as the player, as the play manager, as the sponsor, um, as the VIP, as kind of everything, you know, yeah. I've done a, I've built the servers for Counter-Strike events and done them. I've done the back end of, of, uh, you know, audio and visual. I've literally built the PCs and the streams to set them up. And, you know, so I've kind of sat on all six sides of the fence and done a bit of everything. But what I realized for me over that period of time is I had so many different goals, you know, to be the, the most, um, you know, yeah. famous and accomplished commentator in the world, to be the best Counter-Strike player in the world, yeah. to be the best Battlefield 2 player, to be the global head of marketing for Thermal Take or Corsair, you know, and, and all of these goals change over time, which is why yeah. it's healthy to have goals and it's also healthy to change them if need be. But for me, it was more like, A, I don't like being stuck to one thing or one brand. That's definitely yeah. not about me at all. Um, and B, um, I like working on the industry instead of in the industry. So it brings me to, you know, where I am today with a lot of what we do is helping people monetize in new ways, bringing new brands into the market mm -hmm. and, um, you know, new different, different ways to make money and different ways to think about things. You know, in the, in the past, I did a lot of work like this with computer modders, people who cut up and paint and yeah. make PCs look awesome. And same thing, you know, I distinctly remember remoting into a guy's computer with a invoice template and going over with him this is what this line means here's how you do an invoice i remember right. helping them run through how to apply for an abn i remember passing them on to a lawyer i remember passing them on to an accountant this kind of stuff you know hand holding throughout that yeah. period of time but you know what that's that's exciting to me because these guys were working 60 to 200 hours on a project and getting paid in computer components for multi-million dollar companies so yeah. they're being ripped off entirely and yeah. they were taught that that was okay which is which is really annoying Absolutely not. um but you know i've done that and i've done the same thing with influencers i, I sponsored an mm. influencer called oasis on overwatch when i was at corsair what i was oasis? her first sponsor and um fantastic streamer and awesome person but yeah. you know i had multiple hour-long calls with her and her boyfriend on the phone saying look this is what the sponsorship means to us at corsair here's how it works for you. Here's some examples of other people who have sponsors. Here's why we're paying you this much. And then when we sent them the contract, I was like, here's what the contract means line by line. Mm -hmm. You know, here's what the deliverables portion means. Here's what non-compete means. This is why you're not allowed to use Razor products, you know, yeah. and answering every single question they can throughout that period of time. But what you find is then you have a friend for life and you also have someone who will follow you and do projects with you that may have a uh, low chance of success or yeah. they may just be much more likely to entertain future things with you because you've yeah. spent that time you know Even to if develop they've got a better offer from someone else they're they've kind of built that trust and like some sort of friendship with you yeah yeah and what you find is now that we're doing much more complex and in-depth things they're more likely to entertain that because mm. often if you're an influencer you know if you've got a million subscribers you're getting 10 emails a day from junk apps that are trying to yeah. you know take advantage of you pay you you know a, a dollar per million views to expose yeah. to your audience and you know devalue your brands by promoting some shitty app that barely works um yeah. so you know, you've, you've got a lot to filter out and your defenses are quite high. So if you can use someone like me, and this is me justifying why we exist as a company. Sure, if you want to do a mass campaign with a, with 200 streamers, that's probably not for us because yeah. we're much more personable. But if you want to do something real and tangible, let's say you've got a seed stage company, you want to partner with, an, with a massive influencer like a Keemstar or someone from FaZe, you mm -hmm. want to provide them with equity in the company for promotion, yeah, that's something we can help you out with. We've had those okay. discussions before. We're that's working on those with some people. So it's those difficult problems we like to solve, those in-depth ones. But hey, mm. if you want 100 streamers, go to WeHype or go to Streamlabs or someone like that, Stream Elements. You know, yeah. they're perfect for you. But And that's okay. That's part of a marketing campaign. But understanding where we fit in the market is when things become difficult. It's when um, one of our clients, Unicorn, came to us and said, look, Chris, we want to do influencer promotion. We've tried. It's too hard. Can you just do it for us? Um, and, you know, we slogged through, but I could see why it was simply too hard for them because it was almost too hard for us to oh, do, really? you know, a lot of these campaigns. 
dealing with influencer managers and influencers and them having their walls up and it, and it being a wagering product as well, trying to decide what the perfect game was, what the yeah. type of channel is, making sure they got the right audience. You know, there's so much to take into account. So once again, it's, it's all about that. It's all about that hands-on, hands-on stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's um, big esports, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, we're working yeah. on that. We do a bunch of strategy. We're getting some brands into the industry. We were talking off camera before about some some stuff we're trying to work through at the moment. We're getting a new brand in. Um, awesome. We're, you know, working with some esports teams and such for strategy. You know, anyone from lower yeah. tier to we've been in conversations with Team OG for quite some time about helping them out in some various ways, which would be awesome if that comes to fruition because I'm a big Dota fan. Yeah. Um, to you know, doing some seminars and education and speaking and stuff, you know, it's kind of where I cut my teeth a lot is, is, uh, you know, our investors, they were a client of mine to begin with. And, yeah. you know, I enjoy educating people on the market, providing them with ideas of opportunity, helping them to understand their placement and, and to give them a picture of what the whole ecosystem is. So I guess, yeah, it's cut up into, into those few different sections around influences, around the education and consultancy. Um, and we're also doing some work with sports and helping them to understand how to activate on gaming not not so much esports okay. as a marketing vehicle. So like um, like football going into the gaming world, or is that kind of what you're you're going through? Well, most most of these sports have a problem to solve, right? So yeah. if you're the PGA, and I, I really need to dust up on my numbers, but I believe the average PGA golf fan is 51 years old. So yeah. in 30 years, your fans are literally dying. And if you keep <laughs> if you keep having your um, you know, your average age go up as they are, what happens when the average age hits 90 and the average life expectancy is under 90? You can mm. see what happens there. Your audience is literally going to be dying off <laughs> yeah. and literally. But also the fact if you're only hitting one segment of the market, you're only hitting these kind of people. You know, every, every the typecast of a 50-year-old isn't the same as a typecast of a 15-year-old. They're going to have very different spending habits. They're going to like different types of products. And you're really um, limiting the amount of things you can do in that audience as well. You know, a person who's, if, if you've got an audience that's 15 to 50, you can have so many different brands that fit within that market. A youth culture brand that focused on streetwear and, and golf safe could sell to someone younger, yeah. whereas someone a bit more astute and, and a bit more relaxed and calm can sell to someone that's older. The same way you've got a Mercedes versus a BMW versus a Ferrari versus a Lamborghini. You can yeah. buy all four of those brands. You can buy a car at about 200,000 USD, but they're all yeah. for different types of people. Exactly. Um, so if you're thinking about that, a lot of the other problems they, they may have is live attendance. Let's say cricket in Australia okay. is a game I grew up playing a lot. Live attendance is very poor at the moment. So can you use influences and in gaming to draw people out of the woodwork? If you think about mm -hmm. golf, who we talk to a lot, um, golf in Australia, they're quite innovative. You know, the Victorian Open was the first ever tournament to have mixed men and women playing in the same tournament together. Oh, okay. um, so for them, it's how can they do more innovative things and support new audiences? If you're thinking about the AFL, Australian Football League in Australia, it's very mm -hmm. similar to the NFL in America in the fact that okay. it's basically Australia only, but they've kind of capped their market. They can't really grow unless they reach into yeah. other countries or other regions. So this could be an alternate revenue stream for them. So recapping really what I'm talking about is, is they've got some problems to solve. Some have an aging audience. Some have live attendance issues. Some would like alternate streams of revenue. Um, yeah. and, some would, and some would like digital marketing and digital sales. Let's say you're the UFC. UFC has zero problems selling at any arena they've ever gone to. They yeah. sold out in Australia, they sell at Madison Square Garden. So that's fine. They get $10 million at the gate, which is a cap. You know, you can't possibly expect to yeah. charge everybody $8,000 a ticket no. to increase that. So that means what's scalable for them as a company? Pay-per-view buys. So how can they make more pay-per-view yeah. buys? to say a gaming audience who is used to watching things at home, consuming things online and consuming to purchasing things online. So, Hey, maybe activating on the gaming audience can help them out a little bit with that too. And maybe get some of the gaming audience away from streaming it illegally. So there's, <laughs> there's a few problems to solve. And, and for us, it's not thinking about esports. It's not thinking about how they can buy an esports team, how they can start an esports league yeah. and how they can divert from their main goal, which is to promote golf, cricket, whatever UFC but how can this be an add-on and a marketing add-on to what they do? If you can spend money on Facebook ads and you can spend money on Instagram ads and you can get Robert De Niro to come to the USC, why can't you pay Jake Paul to make stories about it? Why can't you pay yeah. Ninja to make stories about it? Exactly the same way that the NFL, ESPN yeah. NFL got Ninja on to do their panel for a while. 
exactly the same thing. It's not the it's not the NFL going, hey, we're going to get away from our core and we're going no. to run esports in stadium. We're going to do esports co streams with our sports yeah. streams, that kind of stuff, which diverts from from their main goal. We're just going to have an add on into what we're currently doing. So that's a lot of what we're talking about. Whether mm. it's um, live activations, whether it's bringing influencers to the event, whether it's just basic promotion, whether it's some sort of integration where the sports stars play with influencers and such, you know, the thinking for me really around that is that so many people are already doing esports stuff with these sports. And a lot of these sports are saying, look, we don't want to get away from our core business, which is our sport yeah. itself. So me kind of saying, look, this is a marketing ploy. This is an add on. This is something else cool that you can do. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, it's reaching audiences, like you say, they wouldn't, reach otherwise yeah because they're not interested it's in quite interesting. Yeah. like um because a, a company i know that i worked with in the past they brought because you're saying about the live audiences you know for example the golf the atriums go up and then you know there's that sort of line where it sort of ends um mm. but a company i know actually created vr experience for the cricket so they do all the they do all the videoing of uh what's it called what's the cricket like uh tournament called you know the what ashes. the ashes yeah and all that mm. they do all the recording for that but they created a virtual reality experience so they sort of brought gaming and that this whole industry into it and these people could go in and they could go in with their friends and then all put on a vr headset and essentially be playing cricket in a virtual experience awesome. which is really cool and that's sort of mm. i think from what i gather from them that did increase the numbers because they there are a lot of people coming almost mm. just to see that, some of them, just to see, oh, how does this work? You know, I'm sat at home with my VR headset mm. on, interact with other people, doing a bit, but I can go over here and be with everyone else, but still be in VR, playing this game, and then going, you know, watch the cricket afterwards. Mm. It's quite an interesting thing. So it's quite interesting yeah. to see how these companies are trying to evolve the live industry, as well as... Yeah, you know, and it's nice to see them not trying to compete with esports, because it's not... I don't think that's a viable option for them to even try and compete with it. Yeah, they um, don't need to. They don't need to. Like you said, they can they can stay with what they want to be doing. Yeah. And just kind of take a bit of esports if they want to. Mm. Think about it like the Australian Open. You know, that's that's mm. known as as one of the best and yeah. and um, one of the best run sports events in the world. You know, I was talking to one of my friends the other day who goes to the US Open quite a lot. And he said the Australian yeah. Open just absolutely craps all over it. It's, and it's, it's known in Australia as the most innovative and most advanced. And they have a massive right. village uh, outside, which is like an activation zone, which is like a festival. Yeah, it's like right. a music festival, but for sports, there's music, there's sponsor activations, there's food trucks, there's so much going on. So That's why amazing. is there not a gaming activation section on that? Yeah. You know, how many people want to play, you know, the the games that might be at a fair today, you know, the clown stuff, the throwing, the target shooting, the throwing pins at mm. the at, at the balloons, et cetera. Why not have a gaming experience as part of it as well? Give the kids what they want. And primarily it's, yeah. it's once again, it's not diverting from your main thing, which is the tennis, but it's giving the kids a great experience and a good feeling while they're there. So instead yeah. of begrudgingly being dragged along to the golf <laughs> by the mum and the dad, they get to go play Fortnite for 30 minutes and they go, well, actually I'm going to stick around. Maybe this golf thing's kind of cool. And yeah. next time they want to be dragged to the golf, they're going to go because they might get to do something yeah. cool and exciting. That's actually relevant to them. And then that could foster into an interest into, into golf for them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Really good point. yeah it's build, building that relationship with the, with the sport. Yeah. Yeah. It's trying to get the younger people. And like you say, a lot of younger people are more interested in sitting at home, playing their games, watching the people on Twitch and all that. Mm. Esports. The only event that they might attend is an esports event, um, you know, or go to these like uh, big esports events that you've got going on, um, and not actually attend the live ones necessarily. Like for example, Wimbledon even. But imagine mm. if you go to Wimbledon, take your kids, and they're like, oh, you know, I don't really want to go. But then again, there's like a gaming experience, or even again a VR experience. You know, they've got the mm. hands, and you know, they're against their their brother or their sister. You know having a bit of a bash like we tennis but yeah. way high level <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it's you know it's it's a very common misconception that gamers don't want to leave their bedrooms and mm. the answer to that that i always say is they do but it has to be a money can buy experience it has to be something worth them going to so yeah. there's no point you know people don't want to just go hang out at the skate park anymore necessarily because they've got uber eats at home they've got air conditioning 
they're comfortable and they can still yeah. talk to their friends through discord through snapchat through tiktok through whatever platform they want or hang out together in Fortnite or dota 2 like yeah. myself and my mates do you know we we even the ones we live in the same state with we probably catch up once every three months in person because we mainly hang out in discord and dota 2 together yeah you know talk a bit of shit and have a bit of fun so you know if you're thinking about that if you're running a live event what's your actual draw card for these people is it tier three live music from the local yeah. person on an acoustic guitar there that they're not really interested in is it sub par quality fish and chips that you can buy um you know is it the expensive cost of entry that they would rather be spending on alcohol or consumer or goods or whatever it is yeah yeah so just think about that when you're planning an event about why people would like to attend and mm. you know that's that's some of the problems that we're trying to help these people to solve unfortunately a lot of the time as with anything in esports and this is why we work so much in influences um working in esports is rolling a boulder up a hill <laughs> a lot of the time trying to convince these people because people yeah. are stuck in their ways a lot they're already making a lot of money let's say um you know so trying to convince them to invest in something new can be very hard especially when there's a lot of the time and i've spoken about this many times in my content before about how people are trying to make a sale just to because they need to make a sale and stay alive. Yeah. So that means that often there's bad sales that are being made. Um, so trying to get around, you know, that kind of stuff as well, actually selling a good project can be hard because some people can be cautious, but rightfully so. Um, but yeah. you know, as a business, that's why we do so much work in influences because what we found in esports is there's so much supply. There are, you could, you could probably say there's, there's thousands, uh, probably tens of thousands of esports organizations that exist in the world. I'd say, as a yeah. guess, right? I think that'd be a say there's probably at least eight yeah. to 10,000 of scale of where they have at least 50 Twitter followers. Right. So they're all looking for sponsors. However, how many sponsors are looking to, to sponsor things? Um, 800 thousand and a half. And I've never said these yeah. before. I'm probably just guessing. No, so you yeah. can say that there's a lot of supply. There's barely any demand there. So you're trying to mm. push the boulder uphill to explain to, um, you know, X company, that um you know you should invest in esports for the first time this is a great thing for you to do and that's a six to 12 month sales process that's a six yeah. to 12 months for them to say no so yes. thinking about your runway as a company and that's not saying they always say no but you know let's say they say no that's gonna be your a runway as a company now. you're yeah. paying for wages you're paying for facility that's a lot of time that you could be dedicating that you could be growing your social media presence that you could be growing your twitch yeah. your youtube etc cetera, etc cetera, over that period of time whereas with influencers there's so much supply and so much demand. There's thousands of influencers out there, literally thousands of gaming influencers with a million plus subscribers. Thousands. Yeah. So they've got a lot of supply. They've got a lot of hungry audience, but there's also a lot of demand. There's so many companies that are looking to pay these people to advertise. There's okay. apps, there's consumer goods, there's e-commerce, um, there's you know digital only products, there's new video games, et cetera, et cetera. So there's so much in there too. So for us, you know, we looked at our revenues and we said without even trying, 60% plus of our revenue is coming from influencer work. So it'd be ridiculous huh. not to focus on that. Mm -hmm. And obviously we still work in esports and we are called big esports, but the same thing is when I talk to Kairos esports, the guys that got KFC into gaming, they've considered changing their name to Kairos Gaming to get away yeah, from okay. just that pure esports because for yeah. me being frank focusing on esports as a whole is just i don't see that as a viable product and not for us mm. anyway not unless you're sitting in some specific niche um, where you can afford to do so but for us it's it's not a viable product so it makes much more sense for us to yeah. work with influencers go where the money is and yes we're Absolutely. still going to have one foot in esports all the time and yes we're still called big esports the big esports podcast yeah. and that's my history and i will take any projects in that whenever i can but i'm nowhere near as active as searching for them as i used to be because all the time okay. is trying to convince people who don't want your product mm. and that's that's not a way to run a business and it's not on us to grow the industry ourselves and that's where it fell down to a lot of the time is that we mm. needed to make the industry and then capture the market share rather yeah. than coming into a market, which you can capture some share and then help to grow it. It's on us yeah. to grow it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's not a, that's not a place that, you know, we want to sit in and commercially. No, that's not, it's, not it's a just, place yeah, it's not, uh, it's not sustainable as a business. Mm. How do you, th do you think that uh, kind of perception of esports? is going to change in the near future or is it kind of a long way off before companies start to take notice? It's already changing. It's hard because I find there's a lack of case studies, successful case studies mm. in the industry and public successful case studies in the industry. That's why I've always tried to share them as much as I can 
And I've, I've put this call out so many times that I have so many successful case studies of influencers yeah. that are very cut and dry, that are very straightforward, that I don't have for esports right now. And talking to FaZe's chief revenue officer, Jeff Pabson on my podcast as well, said the same thing. And if FaZe is having trouble, with this section i think everybody whether they admit it or not is having some trouble with this section. yes you know he said that if you are toyota um and you're being pitched to sponsor an nfl team the nfl team can say yes toyota we can see by our numbers that you receive an eight percent uplift in sales across north america if you sponsor our team yeah. in esports i've seen a lot of t1 decks that basically say here's how much money we've won um here's how many twitter followers we have here's how much reach we get um we're in the Dota 2 International, here's how many viewers that got, yeah. League of Legends Worlds, et cetera. And we're going to do X amount of pieces of content for you. And that's about it. And that's half yeah. of the story, really. You're not saying... Um, it's not saying what they're going to actually get out of it. Yeah. So, you know, even FaZe told us a case study. They sold 500K with the champion hoodies in the first five minutes of mm. their campaign. You know, they've done successful meetups where they've got, um, was it like 15 city blocks in New York City or something ridiculous Ooh, like that, lining God. up for their, for their live launch. They've, you know, did the Ewok meetup they did an offset meetup they did a tcl 50k campaign you know so these guys have a lot of case yeah. studies but even they're not confident and they're not dumb so i think that i think that they're probably onto something here that there needs to be more proof in the pudding mm. and less hype and less people thinking about brands as investors and this happened on my side a lot even as a sponsor where a team would come to me and say you know hey we really want to be sponsored by you and i'd say cool we already sponsor a mm. team what yeah. do you offer more than them? And they say, well, if you sponsor us, we'll be bigger than them in 12 months. And I say, well, <laughs> I'm a sponsor, not an investor. So yeah. what if I sponsor you, you grow, and then you go to someone else? That doesn't make yeah. any sense to Come me. Why would I leave the team? Yeah. yeah. Why would I leave the team I'm currently working with to go to you, who's going to provide me with 30 Twitter followers, and then in a year, you're <laughs> going to have 20,000. Like, yes, that's possible, but yeah. it doesn't make any sense to me no. to leave what I'm currently doing. So I think less you know, less about that and, and more, you know, so much that we talked about, say my founders pitch that, that I've been doing, you know, with startups and mm. bringing Taylor on as one of the investors who's actively investing really in the space and someone who's a, you know, a good panelist and an analyst of the industry. Yeah. You know, he's investing purely into better ways to monetize the market because it's become yeah. quite obvious that esports fans aren't being monetized properly with their average mm. spend per user being so low compared to every other sport in existence. Yeah. And, you know, I had this discussion with some people the other day and went on a bit of a rant saying, <laughs> if influencers and esports, the lines are so blurred and influencers are making so much money, they're selling so much merchandise, they're all driving around in Ferraris with big houses. Like if, as long as you've got 2 million subscribers, yeah, you're basically kind of set, right? With sorted. a good audience. Of course, there's good audience and good viewership, you know, yeah. blah, 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 et cetera, right? But let's just use that as a metric to go off. Why can't esports do the same? And why is esports yeah. not doing the same? If, if I've got a case study here of an influencer I know with a seven figure business that sells limited edition hoodies through an Instagram mm -hmm. of 170 to 200,000 followers, why can an, an esports team not do the same thing? Why are they no. not selling a million bucks worth of merch a year off limited edition stuff off a, off a platform that's not even that big off yeah. one person doing it? And I would have thought as well else. that uh, esports... Oh, well, I guess gamers or streamers or esports teams would have a more engaged audience than your kind of classic influencer as well. So if anything, their numbers should be higher. It's hard to say, right? Because mm. like when, when I, I did a bit of a content series about um, Instagram followers versus engagement in esports teams, yeah. and you'll find that the single organization teams will have much higher engagement. And part okay. of that is because imagine if you followed phase yeah. for call of duty black ops 2 like seven years ago well i don't play that anymore so no. you're probably not active on there and you're probably not following them for much what if you followed um team liquid because of their old dota 2 team who are now gone you might still be liking their pages but you're not activating on them whatsoever yeah what if you like an organization for a game they're in like smart or paladins that they don't have anymore or heroes of the storm which doesn't exist anymore yeah um, so that's, that's where it becomes hard as well. So you obviously have a targeted audience because you have a general esports typecast, yeah. but in the same way you don't, because it's kind of like having a Twitter for tennis and soccer, you know, two very different <laughs> sports. One's team, one's off, usually personal one v one. Um, you know, they played on different services with different types of equipment with completely different brands and sponsors involved in them, yeah. except probably Nike and Adidas is everything. So <laughs> thinking about that, 
you know, that's, that's where it becomes, you know, advantageous for a team because you've got bigger numbers, but you know, um, actual, it's also can maybe cause some problems. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like you're saying, it's, I guess, and then it's down to the teams to kind of refine their content so that the people who have engaged with them for a particular team or game, or whatever, are then still continuing to be engaged, even if it's not originally what they followed them for. Yeah, I don't, mm. I don't have the answer. I mean, yeah, people talk about this with um, like ESPN all the time. If ESPN yeah. puts on esports or Fox puts on esports, you know, people want to watch it. If the like it happened here in Australia, an AFL team bought an esports team, the Essendon Bombers bought a team. They renamed it to Bombers. They started posting about it on their Twitter, and everyone's like, "What the hell is this? Like, I follow you guys <laughs> for AFL. I do yeah. not even care like, about is, League of Legends." Yeah. Like I would rather, I actively don't want to see this on my feed <laughs> and I can't blame them. You know, if you yeah. follow an F1 driver, do you want him to be posting about tennis all the time? You know, yeah. probably not. You're probably following him for his F1 content. You know, if you're following a sports team. So I don't, I don't have mm. the right answer for that, but I think the answer as a whole for esports people, for me, from my research seems to be content as a whole, like you were saying, you know, you're looking at people who create fantastic content like uh, hundred thieves, like phase, you know, two yeah. names that get thrown around all the time because that's what they seem to be doing so well. And, and that's why they're attracting these investments. They're attracting these sponsors and they seem to be growing, um, you know, at a very mm. rapid rate compared to others that are focused on being more like a traditional sports team, say a yeah. cloud nine, which is more about winning, you know, that's their identity, but how does that perform? And there's only so many people that can have that identity too within the market. There's so much more scope, I think for, you know, for every 20 organizations that are about content, you can probably have one that's all about winning. So if I was yeah. to put people in categories, you'd think team liquid cloud nine fanatic winning traditional sports team, esports. you know, yeah. stoic been around for a long time, won a lot of tournaments. Anything about content, you've got people like 100 Thieves and FaZe and then, you know, like 100 of these Fortnite organizations that exist now, like Team Kungana, like Raised by Kings, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's yeah. all these that most people have never heard of in the traditional industry, but they've all got 100,000 plus Twitter followers, which is more than a lot of the tier two lot, teams. Places, so, yeah. so, you know, there's only so many kind of, there can only be so many winners, right? You can only have so many people that are within that high class, but I think there's been mm. shown there's such an appetite for content that so many more can be based on that, on that content side of things. Yeah, and absolutely. in the past, a lot of people have just been throwing money against the wall mm -hmm. to try to have the best um, esports team paying more salaries, mm -hmm. paying big buyouts for what to win a tournament that, doesn't really gain you any more followers than some good no. content does that doesn't get you much prize pool because you only retain zero to 15% of the organization. A lot of the time, obviously there's, yeah. there's alternatives sometimes, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Right. So what are you, what are you spending your, your money on and, and how is that benefiting you as a business and what's your profit loss per game title and such? You know, I think cloud nine came out, what was it yesterday, two days ago, they said they lose between one to 2 million a year on their CSGO team. Did they? My God, yeah. That's so insane. people are claiming part of it is because they have a coach an assistant coach, a, a mentor. I don't know. They're saying they have okay. too many staff, but still, right. even if keeping that into account, there's still a lot of money to lose for a business yeah. of any size per year on one single asset. You know, if you're, if you're a restaurant chain, if you're McDonald's and one of your store lose store loses one to 2 million a year and the others don't, well, goodbye. Yeah. It's, <laughs> like, it's closing you know, down. Something that's like, it. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. I've seen a lot of stats and financials within esports, and um, there's there's not a lot that I've seen where they're actually making a profit. Not in terms of the esports teams or mm. uh, platforms as well. To be honest, uh, there's one platform. I think it's um, oh, I can't remember the name, but there's one platform that's losing millions as well. Um, mm. Yeah, mm. like esports mobile, costs. they're spending a lot of money. Yeah, but, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, Look, apparently I think... Amazon loses money, so maybe Twitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's always look. There's always a few sides to that, right? Yeah. It's it's okay. They're relatively early stage in the grand scheme of business existence in the world. They've got time to scale. They are scaling. They're spending that money on growth. Um, but for me, I guess a lot of my lens comes from being more risk adverse. It comes from being, you know, a, a company that hasn't really attracted funding. Like I say, investors, but it was more of an internal funding for us, and it mm. was not a significant amount whatsoever. And we are cash flow positive, partly because we've got a very low burn. I yeah, pay myself yeah. minimum wage. For me, it's about the equity. It's about the growth yeah. in the company. It's about the opportunity. And it's, and it's, that's why I come from that lens of, like I stated before, of not trying to make a sale just to make a sale. 
being yeah. like, is this the yeah. right thing to do? Because I'm set up in that position where I don't have that pressure to have to do that. I don't have to make the sale to keep the lights on. I've got emergency savings. I've got a company and we know that in our pipeline, we've got a lot of massive projects that are starting, that are going to start being announced in the next few weeks. Yeah. But you could say from the outset, it's like, wait, big's been around for a year and a half. What big announcements have you guys made? You haven't done a whole lot of stuff. And that's because we haven't needed to, I haven't needed to make that quick. Yeah. Buck. I haven't needed to make that quick sale because we've been working on the proper campaigns that we would like to work on. So say, for example, with one of our clients now, we're being paid to do a scoping work for them to run their whole global influencer strategy, almost as like an outsourced employee, because they said to us, look, we, because of our relationship with you guys, we trust you so much that it's not going to be a, Hey, Chris, here's 25 grand. I need a million views. Go and make it happen. Like we do do for some brands like NVIDIA in Australia. It's more so Chris, here is our CPA cost per acquisition. Uh, Here's your budget. Go nuts. Just tell us where you need to justify to us what you're going to do. And when we say yes, you do everything. You're responsible for everything. You're responsible for paying for the influencers. You're responsible for the delivery on time. You're responsible for making sure it happens, that you know all of the beats happen. You're responsible for justifying mm. why it does work, why it doesn't, and if it doesn't, provide us with a report, just like an employee would. So for us, yeah. that's that's what I've been working towards. And, and that's where I see a lot of us providing value. And that's why I, I said at the start around our justification as a business is not yeah. as these quick cash massive projects with a hundred influencers, there's plenty of platforms for that. Mm. And that's why people are developing those platforms. For me, it's when yeah. things are really hard to do. It's when you need someone to get hands on. It's when you need that relationship and you need to be able to talk things through with people. Yeah. That's where you have an advantage. But hey, that's that's why we're working a lot with Kieran who I've done a bunch of content with. You yeah, know, yeah. he he's likely to be working much more closely with us this year. And that's what he is really good at. The kid made three hundred grand in a single month at seventeen of signing influencer stuff, which is great. He's, so yeah, this is amazing. why you need to you need to work with these people in business that can do Mm -hmm. both sides. You know, for me, that's, that's not where my passion is and that's not where my experience is, but for him, that is, but the same, it's the opposite, you know, the same, the opposite side of the coin for him, you know, he wants some help with um, some mentoring and scaling and how do you hire staff properly? And, you know, how do you attract investment and and pitch people better and that kind of stuff, how do you install processes? You know, these are the things that we're good at. So that's why, you know, that's when a good business partnership comes together. You find what you're good at, what you're not good at, and then you find yeah. someone. To you find the people who can, yeah, fill in the gaps. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah, exactly. That. And that's, yeah. you know, that's why Google buys people yeah. all the time, right? Google's like, oh shit, we can't, we can't make a video platform to save our life. Video.google.com <laughs> was a piece of trash. They're like, yeah. well, why don't we just buy the best one? Let's just buy YouTube. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Did. and now it's, now it's fantastic. It's awesome. And it's sorted out. Yeah. Um, that's, mm. yeah, that's really interesting. And, um so kind of because influence like influencer marketing and the kind of influencer space although it's been around for a while i still think it's kind of like a wild west situation yeah like no one really knows these influencers like you say some of them can become influencers overnight and they're not really sure how things should be run and i think that's where companies like you really come into play because you're helping manage it without just being like give us this much a month and like you said we'll get you a million views and that'll be yeah there's a lot of um there's a lot of crap managers out there i can say that very um confidently now after working after Mm -hmm. or trying to work with a lot of people over the past year or two um to do client campaigns you know there's a lot of inexperienced managers and a lot of the time, not the fault of their own. They're just mates with yeah. someone who's blown up and they're managing them yeah. or they're disingenuous. think they can rip off people and just take 15, 25% cut just for being mm. an email filter when emails come in and then they do a poor job of that. Um, and you know, it's the same as it's the same as I remember listening to a podcast many moons ago about um, what happens when your kid's band starts to get bigger and often they're managed by the parent and they've got good yeah. will, but they don't know what they're doing because they've yeah. never done a tour before. They've never booked a venue before. They've never worked with promoters before. They don't know any of that kind of stuff. So mm. yes, they have good will in mind because it's their son or their daughter and they want to see them succeed, but they also need to have the humbleness to go, well, maybe I need a bit of help. Maybe we yeah. need to work with some other people to help us out there. And that's, yeah. that's, you know, what happens a lot of the time too, where, yeah, you just get managers that, you know, I'm, I'm hyper aware all the time of not being another shit agency that puts <laughs> ourselves in the middle just to take 10, 15% because we exist. I'm always trying to say what kind of value do we add and why are we here? Yeah. Which is once again, why 
you know, I was talking about before that this is where we fit when the problem is hard to solve or it's very specific when you need to reach out to people and you need a relationship to build a campaign that lasts over several months with someone. It can't just be standoffish. It can't just be, you want me to tweet once more, that's an extra thousand bucks. You know, you yeah. want me to do this, it's extra money. You want me to come to a meeting, that's $200. You want like, you know, it's transactional based. It needs to be that friendship based where mm. we've, you know, we started off a relationship like that with an influencer. And at the end they did three pre-rolls for us for free because we're able to explain to them the meaning behind the whole project, yeah. the viability of working together in the future after this and the massive commission that you could earn with proven results in the past for other yeah. people as well. And saying in the end to this person, look, I don't, I don't want to argue about the bullshit anymore of a thousand dollars for this tweet, $500 for this pre-roll. Yeah. I want to work with you to make $50,000 in commission. So can we stop yeah. talking about that, kind of thing and how you're worried about you might have to tweet two more times and let's just focus together on building something in in business together and building something awesome and gets through to some people doesn't to others but yeah Yeah. that's it's kind of the way that we do a lot of stuff but like you were saying yeah definitely the wild west because Mm. you know some kids on tiktok are getting 200,000 followers overnight and then where the hell do they go to they don't know where to go to and rightfully so they're not told how to manage things you don't learn that stuff in school um you know and there's uh, unlimited managers out there 16 years old Mm. and there's unlimited agents out there that are pokemon collecting right now that are just trying to get as many talent as they can to try to just yeah and it's and it's once again it's the pr model that's failing Mm. where if you look at a lot of the large pr agencies globally this is happening especially in australia they're losing clients they're churning senior executives because a lot of PR agencies are being caught out in the fact that they're, they're in the business of signing as many retainers as possible and then hiring as least amount of staff possible to mm. look after those retainers and then spending the minimum amount of money on those staff as possible to look after those retainers. Yeah. So it's a numbers game. Let's say you sign a retainer for $200,000 for the year. Well, then what you're going to want to do is hire someone $50,000 and make it 50% of their job. So $25,000 plus tax, whatever travel yeah. to look after that. So then lo and behold, you've got 175 coming to you. You've got 25 coming to this person. It's kind of like you're subcontracting and then off you go. Try to sign 30 of those clients, 30 times 175K, fantastic. And then you've got yeah. 15 staff to go with that. Fantastic. My company's worth awesome. a lot of money. <laughs> but the client is like, the hell are you actually doing for me? <laughs> Paying you 200 grand a year, that could pay for two senior staff members to work for me with yeah. travel and some money left over and some extra marketing budget. You know, what's, what's going on here? And that's after talking to some people who work in some of these agencies, it's the same thing. You know, what I'm seeing from the outside, they saw from the inside. They saw, um, they saw clients that were, being, that were paying a retainer to have a full-time staff member where that staff member did not exist. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, that's, yeah, yeah. It's just something that, just something that seems to happen. And, you know, that's, that's what happens with some of these agencies when they're just trying to sign like 30, 40 creators. And I've talked to a few like that who are saying, you know, I don't get anything from these people. I don't know why I'm giving them 15% of my email inbounds because I should be doing it myself. Yeah. And I respect, you know, one of my friends who's got 700,000 YouTube subscribers. I respect him in saying that he doesn't want a manager unless that manager's full-time job is him and only him. It makes sense. Like it makes sense. Yeah. It's it not, it's not as scalable for a business. Sure. No. But, it's about finding that balance, you know, if you're going to yeah. sign 10, 20. And I think that's why people like the misfits have done very well in Australia and click crew because click started with like six and they knew yeah. that they could manage those six very well. They knew yeah. that they could pay enough attention to them to provide them significant growth and, and build a good company, the but then they can start to slowly scale after that. The same way that a lot of successful esports teams are like have started with one team and then they've yes. expanded from there. You know, God sent who had did a podcast with same thing started yeah. with one team expanded from there. Chiefs in Australia, League of Legends, um, you know, phase, Call of Duty. You know, they start with one thing, they do it well, they go to the next. And, you know, yeah. there's a risk sometimes of scaling too fast in business and raising too much money and all that kind of jazz. Um, and I think it's, it's, we're seeing some of this across into the influencer market as well. Yeah. I think it's the... Yeah, it's sometimes kind of you get startups, so they just expand so big that they can't actually, um, they can't uh, grow that fast. And that's what kills quite a lot of these startups off as well that I've realized. And I think a lot of startups don't understand the point of their existence. They, they come up with an idea that's fairly vague and then manage to like, get a load of people and a load of money around it, but then they don't really 
know what they're doing or why they're doing it, which yeah, is that's easy to get important. stuck. Yeah, it's really easy to get stuck into, right? And doing too many things. I talked about this on yeah. my founders founders pitch stream number two, I'm saying I've you know I've had that issue many times myself mm. where I've just tried to chase the money and a new project comes up that looks exciting. Let's just go for it without being like, does this actually add value to the business? Does this add yeah. anything? Are we even making money off this? But sometimes no. Sometimes you have to do so much more work. You know, there was a great yeah. learning from a mentor of mine the other day that was talking about this. They were being paid to do, I think it was 80 hours work a month for a client. But okay. the PR, the, but the agency that was doing it, their staff were doing more like combined 80 hours a week work for them because that was no fault of their own. They're just replying to messages when they get sent through yeah. and doing things immediately. But then you mm -hmm. go back and you think about it and you go, I'm actually losing money from this client. This client is making yeah. me actively lose money because I can't pursue other ones because I'm too busy, too busy doing, doing yeah. four times the amount of work that they're actually paying for. And that's, you know, it's just part of, part of business. And that's something why we're in partnership with PlaySize Studios here because they've got experience in that. They've got experience in making AAA mobile titles for people like Jumanji. Jumanji just came out. They just did a game for Jumanji that was that? licensed awesome. by, the, by the creators. And they have that experience to say, okay, we're going to make Jumanji. Here's how much we need to charge because here's how much it's going to cost us. It's going to cost us this many man hours over this amount of time. We're going to need this yeah. many staff dedicated to it. It means we can't pursue these other projects, you know, this kind of stuff. And it always sounds so simple. Like when you're making an esports startup, you think, ah, I'm not going to have any of these problems that any of these other guys have. They're all <laughs> stupid. They're all idiots. No, you have all of those problems. I've had all of those problems. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. had those problems. You almost, we almost run out of money and then Hail Mary comes in, you sign some clients where you're stressed about a board meeting because you haven't had much movement. And then two hours before the board meeting, someone comes back with some awesome news for you. Like I've had all of these things. It's, it's like, it's almost like it's a, it's almost like it's, it's universe playing a crazy trick that yeah. has to happen that all of these It's problems almost a, a rite of passage, <laughs> isn't it? You, these things always come up and it's like, you have to go yeah. through these to really understand that these things do happen. Um, yeah think about like and it's humbling right think about like jujitsu mm. that i do when you start as a white belt which i am at the moment you just get choked out by everyone all the time it's so humbling <laughs> yeah. but you have to you have to go through that Let's you have to it. be the person who gets submitted 20 times in five minutes <laughs> to then be the person who can actually teach that onto other people like that's yeah. all part of the passage you don't become a black belt without being a white belt first no. and then 10 plus years of training a lot of the time yeah so you know that it's, it's that physicality. It's why you start sparring from day one in jujitsu. It's, it's why, you know, you do a lot of the training and you, and usually you turn up one to three times a week to get better. And it's why it becomes so addictive because there's so much to learn. It's yeah. so exciting, but there's so much payoff. You know, if you run a startup successfully, the payoff is 5 million bucks in your pocket. I think that's pretty good payoff. Yeah, it's, it's you do jiu-jitsu nice. successfully. You can feel, you can feel, feel that advantage coming on because even for me as a white belt, mm. when I first started, you know, getting smashed all the time by everyone, <laughs> you sometimes think I'm not getting any better. This is ridiculous. No. Everyone's still beating me until a new person comes and then you roll against them and you go, holy crap. I just yeah. submitted him five times in, in you yeah, know, five in a minutes. So yeah. You're like, okay, so now it's starting to make sense. And you do similar startups. Often mm. I will think, man, I'm so useless. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, I don't have any skills or experience until someone comes to me with a problem. And then sometimes I catch myself halfway through the explanation of how to fix it and go, shit, I actually do know something. <laughs> this is, like I actually do know something. I do have some value. Yeah, um, I do know what I'm talking yeah. about. This is crazy. Yeah, yeah. I remember. I remember. I was quoting like, I was quoting some study with like six numbers, and halfway through, I went, "Shit, I'm a nerd." But <laughs> like, you know, I seem to at least I've convinced myself I know what I'm talking about yeah. right now. But yeah, you know, for me, like on the tangent, it's it's just about being open and honest. And it's about saying, look, here's what I think. It's about saying, I don't have a fully formed opinion on this. This is what I've seen. Mm. Or it's about justifying, this is why I have this info. Like the PR agencies, you know, I might cut some shit for saying that, but it's part of saying, look, I've identified this from the outside as a brand. Yeah. I felt this and I've talked to some people who've worked in top ones and they've also confirmed this. So this yeah. is why I have this opinion. It's not just the fact of, you know, there's flat because I think so. Um, Counter-Strike yeah. is a dumb game because I said so. Like, <laughs> you know, it's, and they're obviously very, basic stupid examples but you yeah. know that's saying like i always try to walk through that that thinking or if it's an opinion state so yeah yeah exactly it makes a lot of sense um that's awesome i do i want to roll roll back quickly to kind of working more with influencers um and how mm -hmm. that works and you mentioned earlier about 
some influencers and some you're working with at the moment kind of uh, are accepting of like equity as well. How, how does that kind of conversation start? So like most influencers are doing pay for play, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're, it's, it's, it's almost like they're, it's almost like they're trading time for money. You know, there's the old thing yeah. that every clickbait entrepreneur says is you don't trade time for money. You know, you want to make money while you sleep. Yeah. Even if you get paid ten dollars an hour, if you get paid a thousand, you still have to turn up to work and get paid. You yeah. don't get paid while you're sleeping and making e-commerce sales, yada yada buy a yacht. But if you think <laughs> about it from the influencer side of things, a lot of the time they're only making money when they're live streaming because yeah. they're actively losing subscribers if they're not streaming. And if they're not gaining ad revenue, they could be gaining and they're not gaining extra views and growth that they could be gaining yeah. or if they're making videos, if they're not making a video with a sponsored advert in it, they're not getting paid for that sponsor advert. So they have to do that 30, 45, 60 second pre-roll, post-roll, mid-roll, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's all, so it's paid for play. They're getting paid to go to events. A lot of them are making what they deem as good money. What most people would deem as good money right now. However, there's a lifestyle that comes with that a lot of the time too. Yeah. So if you're making 300 grand a year at the moment, like some of my friends are fantastic. What awesome. happens if you have scandal, people don't watch you anymore. If you don't feel like creating content anymore and it dries up. So I have an example of a guy I know fairly well, 300,000 subscribers, made a made considerable amount of money during the CSGO skin gambling, skin betting era, but just mm. fell out of love with making videos. He didn't want to anymore. He didn't have any right. passion for the game, didn't have any passion for making videos. Right. What does he do? Never had yeah. a normal job. Never ran his own sponsorships because he had a manager. Yeah. What does he do? So thankfully he was lucky enough to be able to then edit videos for other YouTubers and become part of that industry. Okay. Right. But right, right, if you yeah. don't have that, what, what do you have? Say you don't edit your own videos. A lot don't make sense because it's, it takes a lot of time. They pay someone 50, 100, 150 time bucks to go skill. do it for them. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens in life after content creation, the same thing as what happens in life after sport, after esports, whatever. Um, so the answer to part of that is, okay, do you own part of a company? Um, if you're a massive influencer and you can enact change, instead of being paid $50,000 to promote a seed stage startup, can you be paid $10,000 and 40 grand with the equity? Can you yeah. then be really bought into that company to help it to grow with your audience? And then you can reap dividends over that longer period of time. If they attract investment, go public or sell, can you then own that portion that gets paid off to you? You know, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's something you have ownership in. And what I see a lot of the time is a lot of influencers, they'll start to create their own business when the channel is already on the downturn. Their views are going yeah. down, their sponsorship deals are going down, their public favor is going down and they go, well, now's the time to make a business. Yeah, no, look at now's, now is, yeah. yeah, now is not the right time to make a business because I understand that it's very exciting when there are a lot of brand deals are coming in and you're exploding and you just hit a million subscribers, yeah, everything's yeah. so busy. You gotta make, I gotta make more content. I gotta stream more. I gotta do more meetups. I gotta do more sponsored things. You know, I gotta keep growing, but also I gotta collab with Ninja and I wanna grow, <laughs> like, et cetera, et cetera. But then it's like, that's probably the right time to, yeah. to take a bit of time to relax and say, okay, I'm going to forego $50,000 worth of deals this year to put that time into myself to create a business or to promote someone else's business. Mm. Because in the long term, mm. that $50,000 can expand much larger into $5 million if the company yeah. sells or something like that. Right. Yeah. Or a long or period of time, $5 million worth of dividends. Yeah. Or a consistent, if you're building a business yourself, like a consistent income that's going to continue on from for years, years and years. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. man, love him or hate him. Even Jake Paul talked about this. He's <laughs> like, should you be promoting someone else's company all the time? Or should you be promoting your own company? Exactly. You know, should you be promoting, should you be promoting Adidas merchandise and main gear merchandise and et cetera, et cetera, or should you make your own merch company? And that's yeah. a question for the influencer to ask themselves and to answer. Yeah. But for some people, it makes sense to do your own stuff. Yeah. Um, and it makes sense to partner with companies and, and to push specific products. Sometimes it, sometimes it makes sense to go with a much smaller company who will give you equity than a much larger one. Who yeah. Won't. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think there's, there's a thing I, I did some content recently about, uh, brands working with influencers and kind of the larger brands are seem to be a lot more controlling of what the influencer can actually create and post about mm -hmm. the brand whereas the smaller ones it seems like they're just like we want something just kind of do whatever works for you um, yeah yeah you definitely get that sometimes there's some brands out there that are just hell to work with <laughs> they want to approve everything they want you to read a script they want you to do oh, God, all this yeah. kind of stuff and in, in the end that works for no one it makes um 
the influence unhappy. It makes the delivery poor. It makes yeah. the viewers unhappy. Yeah. But sometimes you just got to bow to the corporate machine, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And get that 50 K and off you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah. Get the big, yeah. get the big bucks, put your down payment on your Lambo and off you go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm. Um, so what, I guess what kind of tips would you give smaller influencers to start being able to work with brands? My tip or, would be to grow first and then worry about the brands later. I think a lot of people worry too much about the monetization too early in the aspect mm -hmm. and they forget about that, that first impressions matter, that the sponsors are real people yeah. that you could, it's easy to get stuck in your mind when you're working for a Coursera, Razor, et cetera, in a region like, mm. <clears throat> like the UK, Southeast Asia, Australia, you're very busy. You're often doing, um, like for me, when I was at, at Corsair, I was doing, you know, PR, I was doing some social media, I was yeah. doing trade shows, I was helping sales with live events. I was managing the influencers, I was managing the esports sponsorship. I was managing all of the reviews that were happening. Um, you know, and, and other media stuff. I'm doing like seven different things yeah. at once. So yeah. if someone reaches out to me way too early in the piece, sometimes I'm a human, it can get stuck in my mind. That, okay, this person's just begging for a product, they're small and they don't know what they're talking about. So they're not someone mm. I'm going to spend any time on in the future because I literally don't have any time to spend yeah. on anyone and to spend on anything else. So developing your skills, but developing your size first is a very important thing. Everybody yeah. tries way too early. The amount of emails that you get when you're at a company like Corsair, where someone says, hey, mm -hmm. I'm gonna start a review YouTube channel. Can you please send me a $600 power supply to be my first review ever? And oh they get angry God. when you say no, and they say, how could I ever get ahead in this cold, harsh world? Well, yeah. <laughs> is ridiculous. And yeah. uh, to, to those people, even what I say is, do you have a gaming PC right now? Yes. Do you use a gaming keyboard? Yes. Review that. Do you use a gaming mouse? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Review that. Do you use a headset? Yes. Well, review that. And then once you've got some good quality videos, then you can reach out to people and you can ask for, for products for free. And then you can provide as much value to the company as the company provides to you. You know, if I give you a Corsair mouse, I'm probably bringing more views to you than you are to the, the mouse yeah. through your product. Yeah. You know, unless you're of a size that's, you know, worth working with. Worth working. What, um, what kind of general size do you, would you consider like a good threshold to start thinking about partnerships? Yeah, I think about it for a while. I think let's, let's talk in concurrent viewers on Twitch. That's the number that matters to yeah. me, not followers whatsoever. Yeah. And for me, a lot of the time, let's, let's use like Australia with my Corsair hat on. If someone's got, if someone's got between 30 to a hundred, they might be worth seeding a product with. If someone's got 150 plus, they're probably worth doing some sort of paid thing with. Right. If they're 300 plus, they're definitely worth considering doing a, a 12 month kind of paid campaign with. Yeah. And then if they're a thousand plus, that's when you reach that status when, you know, there has to be some serious discussion that goes on. Yeah. So if you think about that in, in concurrent viewership, there's, there's kind of the levels to reach at. I think if you're under 30, a lot of the time, it's just hard for any brand to justify yeah. spending that time. To, to provide you with something and the cost of providing you. And a lot of it's, like I said, it's the time. It's the time getting yeah. to know the person, understanding their audience, watching their stream for a bit and then giving them product. It's like when you've taken four hours of my employee wage time, plus the price of the product, like there is more to it than just that. But yeah. if I'm thinking about the people that I signed on at Corsair to do 12 month sponsorships with, it was Oasis 350 concurrent when I did it. Badjo yeah. 300 and 300 350 concurrent when i did it and pig 800 to a thousand concurrent when i did it so that gives you a bit of an idea about the size yeah, of the, si the size that's a, a decent size to get started with and do you do you what do you think of twitch versus youtube in terms of influences um do you mean like the content wars people being paid to do stuff or like what platform you should focus Just on what platform would be best to focus on Whatever's best for you is the answer. Mm. Most, a lot of people try to do both and they do both very poorly. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, true. if you look at Shroud, most of his YouTube is just highlights, right? Similar yeah. Ninja and stuff because their focus is on Twitch. If you look at Muselk and Laserbeam, completely the opposite. I think yeah. Muselk streamed YouTube. on Twitch like five times ever. And yeah. now he's being paid to pay attention to YouTube to stream. So of course he's going to do it. But um you know, mainly focus on YouTube. So really it's just about what, you know, it's the same as like what you were talking about before is about mm. understanding for your business, what, what your offering is and what your product is. And if your product is entertaining live streams, you don't need to put a lot of effort into, you know, 
post-production YouTube videos because it's not who you are. Yeah. It's not what you're about. Yeah, that's true. You kind of get some, you don't even, I, I don't think with live streams, you even need to have, to start with, any particularly fancy graphics or anything going on. Just if you've got a personality and you're playing a game, then... That's, that's one of the best parts of it. Yeah, you that's need, it. You need barely any setup. You need a good enough PC. You need a basic overlay. You need a Twitch account. Off you go. Yeah. Think about Tyler One. You know, he puts he puts effort. Definitely puts effort into overlays and stuff. Yeah. But they're not like high produced, high quality graphics. But that's part of that's on purpose because that's his brand. <laughs> Think about it's probably not even a great example. Think about a guy called um, Shook on Three, who yeah. used to be a pro ish Halo player. Mm -hmm. started becoming famous because he would rap on stream. And when people would write in the comment in when people would write something in the chat, he would put that into his freestyle rap he was doing. But now mm -hmm. for the past couple of years, he's been traveling around the world, primarily in Australia, fishing on live stream, going to Bali, Thailand, all that kind of stuff. That's he has zero amazing. production value because it's yeah. live. It's, it's on his person when he's in Thailand on a scooter. Yeah. So you can't have, there's no overlays. There's nothing. So yeah. he's reading the chat, but he's very engaging. He's having a good time. So it doesn't cost yeah. much to, to set these kind of things no. up. The we same way, awesome. you know, old buddy, buddy, Joe Rogan says to start a podcast, just get a microphone and do it. That's how you exactly. start a podcast. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing right here. <laughs> yeah. Twitch to Twitch to Mixer. Yeah. That's an interesting one, mm. right? Cause you don't, you don't have that base load of audience that, um, can replenish because no matter who you are you've always got people leaving you right like yeah. people will follow ninja for a day a week a month a year five years whatever but at some period of time most people are going to leave so then how do you get more of that audience in do you have a base load you can draw from twitch yes twitch has a base load of people who are going to twitch going mm -hmm. okay i just want to watch anything to do with fortnite and i do this sometimes with yeah. dota 2 i go on there and go okay i want to watch anything with dota 2 click on a stream no, not that one. I want to watch something English. Uh, no, not that one. I don't want to watch an influencer. That one. Yeah, it's a tournament. Yeah. It's a tournament and it's on Twitch and it's Dota 2. Tick the box. Let's go. If that was on Mixer, I would have never found it. If that was on YouTube or Facebook streaming, I would have never found it. So you don't have that base load of people who are leaving and then coming. And if you're good enough, your base load of people leaving is going to be lower and coming is going to be higher. So there's always over your lifetime of people who've discovered you for the first time and leaving you, they're always going to be both going up. Right? Yeah but you want more people discovering you than they are leaving you. I can't remember who explained this to me. It was a while ago, but it made perfect sense. But if you're on Mixer, they're relying on you to bring the people across to their platform. But then do those people stay around? Do they start going yeah. to other things on Mixer? I don't know. It's hard to say. I think um, part of it for me is what is, what, what is Mixer's, what is, what does Mixer offer that Twitch doesn't? And at the moment mm. I feel like a lot of the marking is, Hey, we're Twitch, but we're not. Um, yeah. Whereas, I mean, YouTube gaming seems to be kind of the same as well, right? So yeah, the question just... then is, you know, if, if you want to release a, if you want to release like a Tesla copy, like what are you doing that Tesla aren't? You can't just say, hey, I'm Tesla, but I'm not. You can't just <laughs> say, hey, I'm Logitech, but I'm not. Yeah. Like you need to, you need to have some point of difference in what you're offering. Mm. You need to be like, uh, you know, Cloud9 versus FaZe. FaZe is like, we're all about yeah. wearing Gucci and swaggering out and playing Call of Duty and <laughs> drinking bottles in the club and making awesome content. But cloud nine is like, we're the best. We win everything. You're like, yeah. okay, they're two teams. They're different. Yeah. Yeah. Two teams competing in the same place, but they do, they're very different things. It comes down to brand again, really brand marketing. Yeah. All that good stuff. And I think yeah. with, with um, mixer, if you decided you wanted to use mixer over Twitch for whatever reason it is, I think that's where other apps become particular of importance, like YouTube, like TikTok, like Instagram, to drive that traffic to mm. your stream. Yeah, and the dis and people are saying the discoverability on Mixer is easier. So while there is a lower yeah. base load, if you're a smaller streamer, you're more likely to be discovered. So you're more likely to hit, <clears throat> let's say, like the possibility. What's what's like the thing they say in business? Business, it's like you know high mm. risk low reward, you know, medium risk, medium yeah. reward, et cetera. So on, um, so, so on, um, mixer, it seems like you've got a, you know, a high chance of medium reward, if that makes sense, yeah. where on Twitch, you're more likely to have a low chance of massive reward, but also a high chance of no reward. So yeah. it just depends, you know, what platform you want to go on to. But from, from what I've seen and, you know, people have educated me on this on LinkedIn and other platforms that if you're new, like Mixer is a very 
good alternative because it's a place where you can go to grow and it's a place where you can go to be more easily discovered than the machine of Twitch where there's just thousands of streamers live at any one time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you think it's worth worthwhile kind of using these multi-stream tools that you can go Twitch, YouTube, Mixer all at the same time? Yeah, I thought about that before. I don't, I don't mm. know. I don't know the answer. I mean, we did it with our founders pitch series to LinkedIn and to Twitch. And then I thought, well, crap, can we just do everything? But can you service all of those platforms at once? Yeah. And are you known as being on that platform? And then if you're a Twitch partner, you can't do that anyway. You have to be exclusive to Twitch if you're oh, a Twitch partner. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't stream on Mixer. You can't stream on anything. You can upload YouTube videos, of course, yeah, and whatever else, but you can't, but you can't, you can't stream on any other YouTube. platform. No, no. Okay. That's, no. That's Unless that's you want to get kicked back to affiliate. Yeah. <laughs> which I think it takes a long time to get partner. It's, it's pretty... Yeah, well, it's like a specific thing, right? It's like affiliate yeah. is like three concurrent viewers and so many hours streams per month, um, yeah. per, per week in a month period. Um, so many followers, whereas partner is much more, it's something like, I think it's something like 70 concurrent viewers, which is, you know, like I was saying by my previous metric, starting to be quite sizable. When yeah. you get to 70, you've got, you've got a good audience. And I know a lot of people who are full time with 70, as long as they've got a very really? supportive audience that's providing with a lot of subscriptions and donations. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, activating on sponsors and that kind of stuff too. But yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Do you think um, it's how do you feel about kind of some influencers? Well, a lot of a lot of people think influencers kind of sell their soul when they're partnering with brands. What do you think about that? Do you think it's just a minority of influencers who just do any and all ads, or do you think it is? A bit of an issue in the industry right now um i think um i think that yes it's always going to happen but i mm. think that the bullshit meter is very high for esports <laughs> people yeah um and uh, you know i shared some articles recently about like rafael nadal and how pr oh, works yeah. at the australian open that if you want to do a meeting if you want to do a, a meeting or you want to do a you're, you're a newspaper, right? And you want to meet with Nadal to talk about him being at the Australian Open. You are kindly suggested, <laughs> kindly required that, um, you know, goes for no longer than 10, 15 minutes. Sure, that's fine. He's a busy guy. He's very famous. He's got a lot of followers. Yeah. But one of your questions has to be about his sponsor. There has to be a picture of his sponsor in your article. And there has to be a picture of him with a backdrop that has a logo of his sponsor in there. And you need to ask him at the end, you know, what he thinks about X sponsor and he'll reply to you about that. So there was an example of like um, mm -hmm. some champagne that, that a tennis guy was sponsored by and they were like, Oh, how do you relax? And he's like, well, when I relax, I like to relax with the best drop of, you know, it's so stupid. And oh for anyone God. who's in the gaming audience, like you're laughing about it, the same thing. Yeah. People are like, come on, man. Come like, on. you know, it's, and, and they make jokes of that in esports. Yeah where yeah. influencers would go like, like we work with a guy called Bajo pants who, mm. you know, we did a 12 month deal with him and PLE and, and um, I sponsored him at Corsair when I was there too. PLE is a PC retailer and Bajo's performed yeah. exceptionally for them, but his ad is hilarious because he brings it up on stream and literally all you can see on stream is his face and everything else is logos <laughs> everywhere. And he goes, this is an advertisement. PLE is the best ever company ever go and buy stuff from them. I guess what That's it works, awesome. but it's a big joke. You know, yeah. and he did a big joke. He did a skit where he was talking to himself about coarse hair, but his, his other self was calling it coarse hair. Yeah. And he was like, no, coarse hair. They're like, yes, coarse hair. And then like just back and forward, like just stupid stuff like that. And it's like, we make yeah. jokes of things like that where people, you know, put TM in their tweet. They're like, you know, go buy G Fuel TM. It's the best ever gamer yeah. Fuel TM yeah. ever, you know, trademark kind of thing. Like, <laughs> so I think that, you know, the bullshit filter is quite high. And, I think that a lot of the time people who hate on influencers are similar kind of people who will hate on um, Instagram, Instagrammers that will hate on people on TikTok, that will hate on LinkedIn because yeah. they're not utilizing the platform for themselves. It's very easy. And I had this discussion the other day about some people who are complaining and said, look, if you're not adding value to it, I don't see why you think you can complain about it. If you're yeah. just sitting back and then watching and judging other people, if you're complaining about an Instagrammer who only posts pictures of their booty, but they're making $3 million a year, like who are you to complain about that? There's an audience that wants to see that. And are all yeah. of those, are all of those 5 million followers that that person has, they all idiots. Like, do they not deserve to consume what they enjoy the yeah. same way that people say, Oh man, you watch people clicking on a screen. That's dumb, dumb as hell. And then we say, 
Well, you watch people throwing a pigskin around and tackling <laughs> yeah. each other in small shorts. Like for some right. people, that's stupid. But yeah. there's a there's an audience for everyone, as long as people like it. Uh, my favorite thing is when people tell the market that the market's wrong. Yeah, like that's you know they say TikTok's dumb, and it's like, okay, <laughs> okay, but it's got billions of viewers. Yeah, like if you're gonna call them all stupid, that's our future. Sure. Yeah. So you raise those kids. Um. So good luck. But, yeah, yeah. Exactly. What do you think? Yeah, of so there's always, there's always going to be sellouts and there's always, you know, there's FTC yeah. guidelines around hashtagging ad and that kind of stuff now. Yeah, and they're getting much more serious about that. They're getting very serious. You know, there was a court case in Australia not too long ago about some other stuff as well, an influencer and a, and a, um, a cafe or a restaurant and, and stuff. Mm. So yeah. Yeah. It'll, I mean, the market will figure itself out. Like that's, yeah. that's always what's happened in the past. Right. And mm. Jamie Skiller, who's a guy who I follow, um, gave me the um, idea to only wear black shirts. Um, he works for Esports Mogul and had a c- couple other jobs. And he posts about this a bit, a bit where people say today is like the worst time ever to be alive. No, it's actually the best time. Yeah. Um, if you look at historical data, but also like, you know, TikTok's ruining kids the same way that you look at articles in the past that TV was ruining kids, that radio was ruining people and giving people brain cancer. Like yeah. you go back in the past, there's always skeptics. There's always the market something. will, the market will yeah. ultimately decide what happens in the end. And if the market right now is saying we love TikTok, well, if you're a brand, start making TikToks. Like there's nothing, there's no way as a brand you're going to have any advantageous thing. If you try to sit on your golden stool and say, no, TikTok's for peasants. That's not about me. That's fine. Someone uses TikTok's going to overtake you. Exactly. And the brands are still using Facebook heavily or something like that. We only do Facebook because TikTok Mm. is rubbish. Um, yeah, I work with a lot of people. I had a, I had someone once come to me, and um, um, they came from a tech company in Taiwan, and they started mm-hmm. working with them in Australia. And their first question for me is, "What tech magazines should we advertise with?" Really? No yeah. way. So, and I mean, it's like, <laughs> a, is that an oxymoron? Is that the right word? Like tech magazine? It's kind of like yeah. you know, if you're if you're consuming technology, do you want to buy a magazine? Do you want to pay 15 bucks a month for a magazine where you can do it for free on Kotaku.com yeah, <laughs> or like exactly. .esports or, or anything like that? TechCrunch or something. Yeah. It's, mm. Or you can even pay five bucks for a premium on something like TechCrunch yeah. a month or whatever and get access to that stuff that you can flick through and yeah. you can control F and find what you actually want to read. Yeah. You have to go through. Get notifications crap when something new comes and you're not yeah. waiting around for it. Yeah. yeah that's, exactly. That is really confusing. <laughs> yeah um so yeah i think we'll uh i think we'll wrap it up with a few more fun questions uh sure. are less intense than the opportunities of tiktok and youtube and all of that <laughs> <laughs> me go on a rant here <laughs> <laughs> no i love it it's amazing i think really we'll be talking all night yeah i could have as well like everything that you said is really i've taken a few notes actually about Right, for example, you're building your own CSGO servers, something I'm trying to mm. figure out. Um, like how hard it is to do that. Um, and mm. that's just your whole business model, really. It's just really interesting to me on some, some notes that I've taken. It's been really mm. good. Yeah. yeah, I think like the biggest thing I've learned really as a startup founder and, you know, big esports, I looked at our contract the other day was, you know, we signed the shareholders agreement in November 2018. And the biggest thing over that time is the work is is the thing I'm the worst at, which is patience. I am not good at patience at all. And I think that's a, a positive virtue in many senses. And that's why yeah. I say Kieran and I get along really well because we hate waiting for people when you don't have to, but also yeah. it's, it's really hard. You know, I remember in the past just being like, I talk to a client, they seem interested. And the next day it's like, let's sign. Like, what are you guys waiting for? Like, let's yeah. go. But you know, sometimes they're busy. Sometimes they've got kids that are sick. <laughs> sometimes like whatever, but it's hard when you're sitting on that side, when you're punching up all the time, yeah. As you do as a startup, you're always punching up. You're yeah. always convincing someone that they should work with you. You're always convincing someone that you're bigger than you are, that, you know, all this kind of stuff that it's just so like ants in your pants just all the time being like, come on, come on, come on. And I feel like, I feel like I'm just fighting and I feel like it's been like that since November last year, which is why startups burn out so much. It's, I feel yeah. like I'm just fighting every day. I'm fighting, fighting for those contracts, fighting for more revenue, fighting for something cool to happen, fighting for the industry to grow. Yeah. And it's just like, I'm punching a heavy bag nonstop. And that's why you get burnt out. But then one day that bag's going to break. And then that's when, that's when it's going to start coming through. Yeah. And it's, it's mm. nice to know that like other people are going through that as well. Um, because all you, all you see on TikTok or Instagram, whatever, is you see the idealized version of a startup, which is <laughs> you have an idea, you get a million dollars in funding 
and then you just get this really cool office and then you sell it and you're a millionaire and that's like <laughs> yeah it's that good joke in Rick and Morty about it when the yeah. devil makes a company. He's like <laughs> doing the welcome speech. It's like, yeah, welcome everyone. He's like, we've just been bought by Google. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. It's, I think that you, you do make the point now. You see these startups and they're all like, oh yeah, fantastic, massive office. I've got 15, mm. employees. you know, we're going to be as big as whatever, Facebook. <laughs> um, but like, as you know, Steve, because you've been through it. Um, yeah. I'm st I'm still starting my startup, and I've gone through two directors. Uh, I've got two now, two new ones who have put on developers and stuff. But it's taken me three years to get to this point. It's not mm. been all fancy and stuff, and I still haven't got any investors. Mm. Well, technically, I have now, but you know, it's all it's been tough. It's been really hard three years. I've had to work full time, which I don't think a lot of people understand. You have to work full time and then work full time again. You know, you're doing yeah. six hours at least every day, eight yeah. hours. Yeah. eight hours on your own thing um mm. and then try to get eight hours of sleep if you can yeah well i always yeah. think the best thing i ever did for my my business was to actually quit my job and go full time because it was like i was i was doing design stuff i was doing some branding on the side where i was working and then you know you get a few little bits coming through every now and then but then as soon as i quit it's like then i had time to focus on getting the clients and actually doing a much better job and then also having time to relax because keeping you know having time to relax is actually important like otherwise you do get burnt out and you do just hate everything and everyone yeah. <laughs> very true yeah and i would say adding on to that is not being in debt is is yes. one of the best things that i did and and i have a, yeah. you know i have an emergency savings that's multiple months of my income and that's fine. You know, I was, yeah. I was afforded that, that, that possibility by working for Corsair, working from home, being paid a good salary compared to the industry average. Um, nice. And you know, being very studious with myself and, and very studious yeah. with my money in that way. And that enabled me to have that safety net that I'm not worrying that a, I don't have kids to feed. So that helps as well. That, yeah. You know, good. and, and B, I don't have a car loan or a house loan or anything or credit card debt that I have to pay off to. Yeah. So the money that comes in is mine. And I can do what I need to do with it. And that's why as a startup founder, say Jerry from Playside Studios, you know, seven years old now, they've got 60, 50, 60 staff, the largest independent games developer in Australia, games and app developer company. Yeah. You know, he didn't pay himself for the first year. He picked up a redundancy of EA, started the company, he lived off that for a year. Of like 20 grand, I think his redundancy was. So, so pretty frugal you know, living. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Especially this, this man loves Gucci. So I don't know how he did it. <laughs> oh, but, um, yeah. but you know, like, it's, it's just what you have to do sometimes. But once again, yeah. it's like I was saying, it's, it's high risk, high reward. And that's, that's why you create a startup a lot of the time, but it's risky can control. It's not just pressing the button on the pokey machine. It's not just, you know, betting no. on the roll of the dice or on a horse winning or Conor McGregor knocking out Donald Cerrone in UFC. Yeah. It's something that you feel. And that's why, that's why people will, you know, invest in it as well, because they'll invest in something they understand. So they have some control over yeah. So if you're a PR agency, you might invest in an esports team because you know that you've already got contacts to all these brands that you think can help to sponsor it to make it a success. So yeah. you're much more likely to win rather than just flipping a coin and throwing down 50G and going heads. Yeah, yeah, going, let's see. <laughs> yeah, like for me as well, I think that's been quite a tough change for myself. Um, you know, I was, a, I was a contractor and I was earning 1,600, two grand a month. And now I quit about, what was it, two or three weeks ago, I think. And I'm having to pay myself, I'm living off like 400, 500 a month. And like mm. being on that amount for like a good five years now to suddenly being on the most minimal amount I can live off for next, probably for the next eight or nine months. Yeah. I know mean, it hasn't really hit me massively, but I know that it is going to in like the next month. Or so. I will yeah. be like, oh, this is really tough. It's hard, <laughs> yeah. but it changes, it changes your, your complete outlook on things when you, when you're kind of forced into that situation, it's like, you know what? I don't need to spend money on going out all the time. I don't need the, I don't need new clothes or anything. My clothes are like fine. Um, they're not falling apart. It does help that my partner is a fashion designer. So if I do break my clothes, I'm like, can you just fix it or do something? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, kind of final, final couple of questions what what is your favorite game either right now or like of all time all time battlefield 2 
It's, it's yep. a game I played um, throughout all the high yeah. school. Skipped a lot of school to play it, which you shouldn't do. Um, <laughs> Don't do and it, yeah, I got a got a Battlefield Two tattoo on my leg to prove it. Have so you? So wow. um, my my best mate has the. Just saw him one day and he had an outline of a, of a two on his arm. Yeah. And I was like, Brad, what the hell is that? And he's like, Oh, it's the start of a Battlefield Two tattoo, but I didn't get it shaded in. Mm. And I was like, A, what the hell? B, it looks terrible. Because where the where the artist did, they must have been drunk. I don't know. Yeah. It wasn't good. But <laughs> see, like, why didn't you get it? colored in as well like it made no sense yeah. to me so basically I had a wedding coming up and i said screw it i want a tattoo one on my leg so i got a battlefield 2 too and then the next year when we caught up again for pax australia i said i'll get my second tattoo which is a pink floyd one and mm. you need to get yours fixed up and he did so we you know did i was best man his wedding um just over a year ago now and we got a cool photo of us together of him battlefield 2 tattoo on his arm and mine on my leg so figured out pretty That's well in the awesome. end but but yeah battlefield 2 as much as a monumental um turd that could be at times with hit yeah. registration and such it's such a good game it's all i could think about for so long and you know we used to go after maths every wednesday in grade 10 to hungry jacks and we would flip over the piece of paper you get on your tray and we'd draw out maps and be like this is the situation i was in last night here's what i did and no. you know all that all that kind of stuff it was so fun i couldn't wait to get home every day to play that game that never awesome. had the same feeling you know when i was Mm. 18 i would go to his place after after work or school depending on what i'm doing yeah. um get there at at five and then i'd play with him until 7 a.m um <laughs> and then go to sleep wake up at one play again until six and then drive home oh my um, god so yeah. you know i'd literally play until my like, brain couldn't work because you reach yeah. like this peak you know somewhere through the 12 cans of coke we were drinking um, <laughs> you'd reach like this peak and then you know once you get to around 6 7 a.m you just know that your brain can't like do the things that you're telling it yeah. to do. You could yeah. telling your hands to like shoot that guy and you're not shooting him properly and you're just dying. So yeah, yeah that's when you, that's when you go, all right, I give up. I'm going to go yeah. get a few I'll, hours of sleep and then I'll, I'll play again. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just sleep off the sugar and then we'll be back. We'll be back <laughs> on it. Yeah. Yeah. What a time, man. What a time. Did you have a, uh, a favorite gaming snack that you'd have? Um, not really. Coke? Yeah, yeah, Coca Cola. I guess bit yeah. a bit of Pepsi Max man these days, trying to keep a bit less sugar. You know, sugar kind of ruins me now. Yeah, but no, not really. It's just kind of whatever's around. I've been a proponent of um, savory food, so yeah, whatever's yeah. whatever's happening. What, cool. whatever's... Never been a massive snacker, I guess myself. And part of that comes from saving money when you're earning minimum wage working yeah, esports, exactly. yeah. I guess. But um, yeah. yeah, big fan of those big meals. You know, get the big meal in and yeah, go. Yeah, I like that. Um, uh, yeah, I quite like a big meal. I like, I do, I do enjoy a bowl of cereal, probably not the best. <laughs> There's always been times where it's like almost tipped over and I'm like, ah, we stop eating <laughs> such cereal. A gamer, such a gamer thing, isn't it? A bowl yeah. of cereal while you're playing. <laughs> yeah, like it's cereal. such a gamer thing. Yeah, yeah. I don't know anyone else who does that besides gamers, like has no. a 9pm bowl of cereal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just like, oh, what can I eat? Cereal, I mean, that's kind of yeah. an all-time food, really. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah, as they call it, dog food for humans. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dog food for humans. I love that. I might yeah. start calling it that actually. Um, yeah, that, that's awesome. So that's kind of, I think that's, I mean, we could keep going on for hours, I think. So mm. <laughs> there's got to be a time where we wrap it up at some point. Um, so if you want to kind of promote whatever you want to promote for the next 30 seconds, minute, or whatever it is, tell us mm -hmm. what you're doing at the moment. Go for it. Yeah, sure. So you can follow me on any of the socials at Smithy Mayo. Um, you can also follow Big Esports. You can head to bigesports.gg. Take a look. You know, we one thing I didn't talk about is we we do have a pre-recorded um, education piece on how to get into esports, whether it's getting your first sponsor, getting your first job, or working your way from another industry into there. And, and that's been mm -hmm. rather successful for us, and it's been picking up quite a lot recently. And that's an online course. You take it at your own time. The first module's free. You get added into a private community where you can talk to other people who do the same stuff. Awesome. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at an entry, entry path in, that's, that's one way to get in there. And, and part of that was because I was sick of telling everybody the same thing all the time and thought, well, what's yeah. a more efficient way that I can tell people the same thing, record a video, off you go sit in this sit in exactly. this this here room so yeah getting to, getting to see that preview oh, of it nice. too but yeah besides that i'd also say head to gamer gamerade.com 
which is a upcoming not-for-profit that's supporting charities in a gaming sense. They've raised a bunch of money and awareness for the Australian bushfires. I donated to them um, and I've worked with them before too. Yeah. The guys that run that, Josh Swifty and, and Aiden Hico, fantastic boys. And they're going through the process of registering it as an actual charity. So yeah, that's I'd amazing. say go check out them too. Yeah. And we'll put all the links to all of those things in the description as well. Um, one really quick question. Um, with uh, big esports, is there any kind of level of company that you're looking to work with? Or is it you can be a tiny company, massive? Is there kind of mm -hmm. a... An idea. We're doing influencer. We're doing influencer campaigns. Anything from 10k US to 1.2 million dollar budget at the moment, yeah. and and upwards. So yeah, it just really depends. You know, a lot of people say, "What's your minimum in engagement um, for yeah. us?" And a lot of the time, it's around 3k. It's hard to justify as a company to do anything under that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And 3k is more of a passion. You know, we're working with one company at the moment around that, but that's because I see a big upside in them. I like the guys. I like what they're doing, and we're not going to yeah. lose money on it. But we're not really going to make any money on it. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a something it's a good yeah. project to do fun yeah something i deem worth doing mm. yeah That's for cool. sure awesome well thanks for cool. thanks for coming on again it's uh no it's been really interesting talking to you and uh we'll see everyone who's listened to this on the next one hey thank you for listening to the land party podcast we hope you've enjoyed listening to it as much as we've enjoyed recording it it's amazing talking to these incredible people we are always looking for more people to come on. So if you're in the esports industry, just get in touch and let us know you're interested in coming on board. Also, Land Party is a project that we're working on right now. And we are currently looking for investment to make it even more of a reality, to speed the project up, to make it better than it could be with what we've got at the moment. And we're also looking for developers who maybe want to come on board and work with us on creating this new technology that's going to change the face of esports so if you're interested in that let me know just drop us an email and we can start the conversation <laughs>